countrymen and my fellow Americans, La Republica Americana is on air from Philadelphia, broadcasting worldwide from the cradle of American democracy. Here's Robert Patrone and Michael DePilla. Salve, I'm Rob Patrone. And I'm Mike DePilla. And this is... La Repubblica Americana. Where we explore how the Western world modeled the Roman Republic and how Italian culture influenced our Western heritage. Mike, of course, no one ever disputed that when the great sailor, underground railroad conductor, abolitionist, emancipator, and civil rights activist Christopher Columbus arrived in the Americas, that there, there were people here who had preceded him. No one ever disputes that. You know, there's there was the Clovis people, a mysterious prehistoric Pleistocene hominid that was likely the first to colonize the continents of the Americas. And then the Clovis people were replaced somehow by colonizers from Asia who crossed the Bering Strait over ice bridges that had formed during the Ice Age and became the many Indian tribes of the Americas, the, the people mistakenly referred to as indigenous people. They were, they were actually Asiatic colonizers. Then possibly the Romans made landfall in North America based on some Roman helmets and swords and other artifacts found off the coast of the Carolinas. And then, of course, the Norse explorers who set up temporary encampments to cull lumber and then packed back up and left with barely a trace. And then the Portuguese, whose tales of a land across the Atlantic Ocean fueled the imagination of a young genuine cabin boy slash sailor's apprentice named Cristoforo Colombo, Christopher Columbus, who finally brought the Americas to light to the rest of the world. And, you know, another thing Columbus did, besides the aforementioned emancipation of the Tainos, uh, abolition of Taino enslavement by the Caribs uh, first, and then by the Spaniards second, and all his other civil rights activism, was to begin the Colombian exchange, the world-changing interchange of goods, art, music, science, ideas, and people between Europe and the Americas. So, the first importer of Western culture's treasures to the Americas was Christopher Columbus, an Italian, but he was not the last. Mike, today, let's talk about some other important importers and the potpourri of Italian potables and other portables they transported. So, are you ready? Shall we begin? Uh, where do we begin? We begin uh, uh, 1739. You know, we have Ben Franklin, who uh, was, of course, the first postmaster in Philadelphia, but he was right on Market Street, and he started selling books there, including the works of famous Romans like Virgil and Ovid. Yeah, and 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 he, you know, at the time he's doing this, 1739, he's. He's recently elected the official printer of Pennsylvania. That that happened in, in 1730. So he's already nine years he's been the official printer of Pennsylvania. And then uh, in, in 36, he's appointed the clerk of the Pennsylvania Assembly. And 37, he's, a, he's appointed postmaster. So he's doing all these jobs. And he's selling books humbly on Market Street. And, and among them are, are these works of Virgil and Ovid. Now, so for, for folks who... Who, who don't remember their, their, their classical teachings from school or who have not received them, which would be, I guess, anybody uh, born in the 1960s and thereafter. Uh, we, we, Virgil refers to Publius Virgilis Maro, and, and Virgilis Maro is an ancient Roman poet uh, during the lifetime of Christ. And, uh, and Virgil wrote uh, the Echologues, which are poems about revolution in Rome, uh, about three decades before Christ, he wrote those. And then they wrote the, the Georgics, which are some more rural poetry. But perhaps he's, he's best known for the Aeneid, which is the story of the fall of Troy and the sending uh, of Paris to the Italian peninsula, where he was said to, to, to found Rome. So that's, that's Virgil. He wrote all that stuff. And then uh, Ovid is a reference to Publius Ovidius Naso, who is a content? I don't know why his last name is Nazo. He must have had a big nose. I don't know, but he was a contemporary poet of Virgil, and and he also wrote like epic poems. For, uh, 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 Ovid wrote love poems. He wrote satirical poems. But again, he's probably most famous for the Metamorphoses, which is of all things 
a 15-book catalog of Greek and Roman mythology written in dactylic hexameter. I, I, I've never really been able to wrap my mind around. The guy wrote an index in, in poetry. He turned an index to poetry. Like, the, like you, you turn to the back of your, of your geology textbook in school, and there was an index, you know, selenite and graphite. But, but it's, it's, in, it's a poem. <laughs> that just freaks, I don't know, that's weird, that weird to me out. All right. And so, interestingly, that's yeah. what Ben Franklin was selling, that, that yeah. work, the metamorphosis and the amoeba. There, there you go. So he says actually selling these 15, these 15 books. I love it. So, all right. So, so Franklin's doing that in 39. In, in, in 1742, I almost said 19, 1942. In 1742, he's still selling stuff. What, what is he selling? They go on to sell uh, what they call mezzotintos. What is that? Uh, these, these are these great uh, small paintings, but they were actually etched into the wood. And they had special... Um, carving tools that they use to create these mezzotintos um, and they would create them of different people and they was like stripple dots and hash marks so sort of like our computers today <laughs> right right so so they these, it's like a pixel it's like a pixel so these 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 painting plates used like, like hatching and, and stipple dots like but like really really small uh, rather than doing it by hand like like most printers would do um, they, they were really, really small and embedded in the plate, and you would dip this textured plate into into black ink, and it would make gray imprints. So, so because you know some of the ink, you would you dip it in the ink and you'd wipe it off, and so the the the, the tops of the of the of the um, of the texture would be wiped clean of ink, but the recesses of the texture would still have some ink in it. And when you press that down, instead of making a black imprint. It would make a gray imprint, a half, a half ink, a mezzo tinto, and that's why they're called mezzo tinto. So, yeah, so I, interestingly, the one of the first uh, pictures of George Washington that we have is a mezzo tinto that was done um, by Charles Peel right here in Philadelphia as well. Beautiful, I love that. I love that. Yeah, they they, they really revolutionized uh, printing methods, and you know it's interesting because. Then, like in the Victorian era, which of course comes later, um, they're not even really, a lot of artists aren't even using the mezzo tinto method. They're, you, they're making dark spaces in their artwork by hand drawing the, the hatches, the lines, or the, or the stipples, the dots. So, so uh, you know, Franklin really was ahead of his time, man, and, and this whole mezzo tinto uh, process is, you know, I love it. It's beautiful. So, uh, and, and listen, you know, here on, on Radio Voice Italia, when we present you, with historical facts and, and stuff, uh, we go back to the primary historical sources. We're not reading secondary sources here. We're, we're reading. We, we get historians on here who have read the primary historical sources. When I did the you know the, the Christopher Columbus University those fifty episodes, I was relying. I went back and I read the primary historical sources in fifteenth century Spanish to make sure that I was giving you uh, you know the, the facts without spin. But, um, and, and, and here we're reading the original newspaper articles that were done in the 1700s. Right. And that's why I have Mike on the show, because I, I did not do this research. Mike did the research. So I'm really just the facilitator, and Mike is the brains. And Mike, you've read these articles. You've collected these articles. Where, where are these articles uh, in part? Where did, let's talk about this. Yeah, so this is, you know, everybody probably knows, like, Philly News, and you can go into the archives you know, and you can get news articles for the last 20 years. But turns out that the library has digitized all of Ben Franklin's news, the Pennsylvania Gazette from the 1700s, and a whole host of other newspapers from that time period. Oh, and all these articles are um, digitized and they're available for research from the Philadelphia Free Library. And you've done it. I mean, I've seen your collection uh, of, at least I've seen in, in an earlier version. I know you've updated it, and I haven't. Uh, yeah, and I continue. I, I just found, yeah, so, you know, of course, now for our readers, you know, we, we're talking about books, but let's get to the stuff that we all love, which is food, right? Oh, let's do it. All right, so, so 17, you know, let's stay in 1742. So Franklin's selling these, these mezzo tinto. Who else is selling foods in 1742? Yeah, we have John Bard, who's a purveyor of medicines, but interestingly, he's selling olive oil, but in, back then they called it Florence oil, and uh, that was in July of 1742. I and so that. olive oil was, was very, very sought out uh, by the colonists, 
And as, as time went on, there were, there were Italians that settled in Philadelphia, one of them being John Moosey, who lived on 3rd and Chestnut. Um, but he actually owned the house at 7th and Market that Thomas Jefferson rented uh, when he was Secretary of State here. And interestingly, even Thomas Jefferson was buying not just a little bottle of olive oil, but 10 gallons, he said, please procure for me, Mr. Moosey. <laughs> oh, my God. Take, what the heck is Thomas Jefferson going to do? With I love it. And, and it, when, when you say the house that he was renting, is it, was that the Grant House where he wrote the Declaration of Independence? Exactly. Oh, exactly. ladies and gentlemen, if you, if you ever come to Philadelphia, you know, we have a lot of great museums, or if you live in or near Philly, we have a lot of great museums, but one of my favorites is the Graff House right on 7th and Market. It's this little corner home, and it's it's the place where you know that, that Mike is talking about, but but Thomas Jefferson was was renting in there when he wrote the Declaration of Independence. And, and when I walk into the Graff House, I, I get a chill, man. It's like it, it, because this is this is where it started. This is where the, the, the idea you know, America is one of the few countries that was started with the pen rather than the sword. You know, we declared our independence, you know, with a, with a quill. And uh, that that's where it happened. That's where the quill was. It was in the Graff House, and it's, and it's converted into a, a museum about the Declaration of Independence and, and the Constitution. It's just magnificent. So if you could do that. And, and you know, I, I this this didn't happen, Mike, what I'm about to, to tell you. But but I like to imagine that it did. This is, the, this is the image I have in my head. So it's 1742, and Benjamin Franklin is... Is out there on, on, on Market Street. He's, he's, he's selling books. He's sitting on a pile of books. He's got his feet up on a big box of mezzo tinto, and he's and he's reading he's reading uh, the, the the Ovid's the Poetic Index. He's reading one of the volumes of the Metamorphoses, just to pass time until until some customers come by. Couple a couple of doors down, we got we got John Bard. He's selling his olive oil. A couple of doors down. And, and so it's how Franklin opens up the index. He comes across this in the index, this poem. Sailors in a great tempest are tossed upon the waves, but toss the oil of olives compressed and find that they are saved. See Virgil's Aeneid, page 456. And he's like, wait a minute, the Aeneid? I have the Aeneid. And he, you know, he gets up from the books he's sitting on, he digs through, and he finds Virgil's Aeneid. He turns to page 456, as, as indicated by Ovid's poetic index. And he reads this story about, I don't know, like, like Paris, uh, the, the, the character from, from Greek mythology, Paris, uh, leaving the, the, the Trojan War after the Trojan War is over, sailing to the Italian peninsula to, to found Rome or whatever. And he and his sailors come across this, this ocean tempest, and, and Paris says to his sailors, get, get me some olive oil and toss it upon these waves. And they, and they toss olive oil upon the waves, and it calms the waves. And Benjamin Franklin's like, is that mythology or is that real? This this I gotta try because you, you told us this story, Mike. Yeah. So as, as time goes on, when Ben Franklin gets his assignment to go to uh, England in the seven, 1770s, uh, he tries this out himself. He tries it, <laughs> and what happens? It works, right? And sure enough, it does work. He, he, he's on a ship, and he says to the sailors, they hit a storm. And he's like. Go, go into the pantry and get the olive oil left over from cooking breakfast. I want to try something. And they bring him the oil, and he throws it overboard, and it calms the waves. And he goes, I'll be darned. That wasn't mythology. That was real. So so then in my head, right, because this part is not real. We're, we're going back to, to Rob's fictional head cannon. He goes, he goes back to Market Street, and he, and, he, and he knocks on the door of John Bard's store, and he says, John, you, you, let me show you something. And he, and he shows him, you know, the, the Aeneid, page 456, and, and, he, and he says, see, see the story about, you know, Paris and his sailors throwing olive oil in the waves, and it, and it calms the waves? I, I tried this, and it works. And John Bard is like, no way, dude. And Franklin's like, yes way, I tried it, it works. So John Bard, like, goes out to the sidewalk, and he's starts hawking his olive oil and he's yelling to all the ladies in the street buying the ingredients for tonight's dinner. He's like, get your olive oil here. It'll calm the ocean waves. And the old ladies are like, really? The, the olive oil calms the ocean? Yes, Benjamin Franklin tried it. And they're like, Benjamin Franklin, that man is a menace, but I'll buy some olive oil. So they buy the olive oil and they're thinking to themselves like, if olive oil calms the raging waves, maybe it'll calm my raging husband and it'll make him a lot less annoying. So that they go home and instead of making, you know, instead of using corn oil to bake whatever they cooked in colonial America, fritters or something, they substitute with olive oil 
and suddenly their their husbands are a lot more amicable and pleasing, and they're like, well, God bless that John Bard. He really knows. <laughs> I don't know. Like, it's just a story I made up in my head, but I like to think that's all right. So let's move on to about 1750. Uh, there's another John uh, who's a purveyor of medicines uh, on the on Second Street, and what's he selling? Yeah, so he's selling uh, borax from. Uh all the way from Venice. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is it, isn't that that comedic character by Saksha Baron Cohen, who's supposed to be from Kazakhstan? Very nice. Uh, my name is Borax. I come from a Kazakhstan. Is, what is, isn't that Borax? No, 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 no. This is what? the Borax that's like a soul. <laughs> what, is, what is it? Yeah, so, you know, of course, Italy had its great trade um, across, across, what do you call it, the Noodle Highway there. Oh, the, uh, yeah, Silk the, Road. Uh, Silk Road, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which which one author has actually called it the Noodle Highway because they think the you know the pasta came yeah. all the way across. It totally did. Yeah. So uh, Venice, of course, we're talking about Venice, and who else but Venice to be importing this salt product from Tibet and Persia? Oh, uh, borax. Oh, oh, borax. I know now. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, by the by the colonial era, era they're using it for for a lot of stuff, right? Like, what are they using? borax for in the colonial era oh yeah they used it for curing meat and uh pottery insect repellent ink yeah, yeah all I've, sorts of things i've heard that 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 uh, moths and ants don't like borax and it will repel them they also use it in um any anybody who's a who, who's a welder uh blacksmiths used it as flux or at least used it in flux uh, to, to, which is a powder that you use for welding. And uh, Clifton, yeah, he's not only selling medicines and borax, he's selling textiles, he's also selling foods. What what else is he is he selling? Yeah, so he's serving, selling our famous uh, vermicelli. <laughs> vermicelli, now listen. Second and Arch. At sec- oh, Second and Arch, yeah, all right, I'm gonna get back to Second and Arch in a moment, but. Yeah, uh, just but, down the street from where uh, Betsy Ross would be. Betsy Ross's house and Alfred's Alley, uh, which is what I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. But but if, if you're Italian American, you you undoubtedly think you know what vermicelli is. I say think because in Italy, they they talk about a different sized pasta in Italy. So in in the United States, vermicelli is is pasta that looks like spaghetti, but it's thinner than spaghetti. But you cross the Atlantic Ocean, you go over there into Italy, and vermicelli is a is a spaghetti like pasta that is thicker than spaghetti. So in the United States, I don't know who just who who like comes up with these numbers, Mike. I, I think maybe like maybe the Italian consulate has like a weights and measures division for color. Oh, yeah, there are uh, all these standards. In all these standards, but like like in, in the United States, spaghetti is between point zero six inches and 0.11 inches in diameter. But vermicelli is less than that minimum range. It's anything less than 0.06 inches. So spaghetti in the in, in vermicelli is, is thinner than spaghetti in the United States. Now in Italy, spaghetti has a narrower range than Italian spaghetti, than, than in, uh, American spaghetti. Spaghetti in Italy is between 0.06 inches and 0.07, I'm sorry, yeah, 0.076 inches and 0.079 inches. So it's it's still within the um, uh, American range, but it's a narrower range. But vermicelli in Italy is above the maximum of the Italian range of spaghetti. So it's 0.082, and, and, and it goes up to 0.091 inches. Of course, they measure it in millimeters. But so... I mean, we're talking about fr- like hundreds of an inch, but but there's but there's a range. And the interesting part, I think, is that the, the, in in America, if you go below the minimum diameter range for spaghetti, you're immediately in vermicelli land. But in Italy, if you go above the maximum range for spaghetti diameter, you're you're not immediately in vermicelli land. There are other pastas between the spaghetti and the vermicelli. I mean, these Italians are, you think we take in, in America, the Italian Americans take our pasta seriously. The Italians really take it. But you know, we're talking, as I said, we're talking about hundreds of an inch. So really, Mike, we're, we're kind of splitting angel hairs here, I would say, wouldn't you say that? Yeah. <laughs> so, but Italians, you know, as Mike mentioned, Italians aren't the only people that, that use vermicelli. It, it did come from Asia. And so you'll find it a lot in Vietnamese food, you'll find it in, 
Got a lot of Thai food, like my, my favorite, uh, the Thai food, which is Pad Thai. Pad Thai, yeah. What is your favorite vermicelli recipe, Mike? Uh, well, interestingly, I made this just the other night. I made the vermicelli de asanguinate, which is uh, in a garlic, the anchovy, and um, sauteed in, um, yeah, in olive oil, of course. <laughs> yeah, olive oil from John Bard's, <laughs> from John Bard's store, maybe. Yeah, chili, you can put chili peppers in it. You know, I'm calabrese, so we'll, we'll put chili peppers in it. You can put capers in it. And this is actually served uh, on the, uh, every June 24th in Italy, all across Italy, on the Feast of San Giovanni. That's, for those of you who don't know, San Giovanni, that's John the Baptist, ladies and gentlemen. And I got to tell you, this recipe is so good, I lose my head over it every time. I really do. I just, what, what, what? Too soon, Mike? Too soon? We give, it another, <laughs> give it another 2,000 years for that joke to land. All right. So let's move on. 1784. A company called Willing, Morris, and Swanwick. This is a Philadelphia mercantile house that, that did business with Thomas Jefferson also. They sold clothing, they sold musket shot, and they sold foods. What foods did they sell that would be interesting to our audience? Uh, well, the, so this is the other piece of the puzzle, which is if you have that vermicelli and you got your olive oil, you're going to need some parmesano. Parmesano, that's parmesano. Right. Uh, and so, where did their Parmesano come from? That well, uh, of course, Parma is is the capital of. Uh, I've been there of the prosciutto and the and the Parma uh, cheese, and the closest port there is uh, Livorno, which uh, you know Philadelphia started trade with Livorno as early as the 1760s, uh, when our first boat left Philadelphia for Livorno, or what the Americans or British called Leghorn. Right. And it's just outside Pisa. And the other thing they were doing is they were importing Italian filberts and pistachio nuts. I love it. You know, I love uh, Italians, Italian Americans, especially, especially like my grandparents' generation. They loved mixed nuts. Like, like you, you, after a big Sunday dinner, one of the desserts that would be brought out would just be a bowl of mixed nuts, and they would be what would be in there? Like, like walnuts, uh, almond, Brazilian uh, nuts, and of course. Yeah. Filter, right. yeah, hazelnuts, hazelnuts, pistachios, and I remember, like my my uh, my great uncles, they're all sitting around the table cracking with the with the nutcrackers, you know, the the, the, the V-shaped nutcracker. They're cracking them and eating and popping them, and sometimes you could like you could roast them. You'd seize them with rosemary and garlic. Oh God, it's so good. I love. I just I love mixed nuts and uh, right. and Willing but, Morris. But, go ahead. I wanted to go back to that Parmesano. So, you know, a few years later, uh, Jefferson's in Philadelphia. And by this point, he's tired of the importing of the vermicelli because he had gone overseas as uh, our ambassador to France. And as part of that, he gets to go to uh, northern Italy mm -hmm. and he gets to taste real pasta, Italian pasta. Mm -hmm. And he says to his secretary, uh, Short, you have to find me one of these spaghetti machines or, to make macaroni here. And so he orders him to find it, and he goes all throughout Italy, and this is all documented in letters that are going between him and Thomas Jefferson, and finally founds it in the land of Mangia, Mangia Macaroni in, in Napoli. And he imports the machine, and by this point, Thomas Jefferson is Secretary of State, and it comes to Philadelphia, and he holds a great dinner in Philadelphia, and of course, he seasons it with Parmigiano. So. <laughs> Love it. There you go. All right, I think we have our, our menu for our next martini night. We'll start off with martinis. Then we'll make some uh, some vermicelli, uh, vermicelli alla sanguinaria, as, as featured in uh, in, uh, in John Clifton's ad. And then we'll end with a mix of, uh, you know, a bowl of uh, mixed roasted nuts as featured in Willing Morris and Swanwick's ad. And, and you know who else features a couple of Italian nuts, Mike? Radio Voice Italia. That's right, you and me, Mike. That's us. All right, dimmi, Michele, qual è il tuo noce preferito? Pistacchio. <laughs> now that's Italian. Thank you for tuning in, folks, and be sure to visit Mike DePilla and me, Rob Patron, next time on Radio Voice Italia at La Repubblica Americana. Please get